actions. So that's that's like identifying different patterns of data flows. And if you want to flag up uh, the incidents and act upon them uh, in case of issues, or uh, what are the uh, fraudulent actors uh, who have access to my accounts, or what what is it the current uh, consumption level looking like, and do I have to predict uh, the proportion of my uh, co consumption units and plan for capacity as well, or uh, I have uh, you know. In, I'm able to meet day-to-day -day requirements, able to process uh, about terabytes of data. What if I can take it forward a little further to enable forecasting or clustering use cases on the existing amount of uh, data that I have? Now, data definitely keeps growing expon exponentially that we know uh, and depends upon uh, the scale and the market that you're currently operating in. Uh, let's say someone who's operating in... Um, a, a BTC platform or uh, you're gathering uh, customer clicks, then uh, definitely uh, data keeps growing in uh, GBs almost every day, or it could be terabytes as well. I mean, uh, somebody who is uh, crawling data from social media platforms. So having said that, what will help resolve <laughs> these issues is to have uh, a, an easy mechanism to deploy, self-serve, and also scale the uh, every single component of your data workflows. Hope uh, that has give you, given you an, enough context uh, on the session itself. And um, so the agenda is, I'm gonna talk about a few of the AWS services that can help you resolve these challenges. Uh, basically uh, superimposing AWS services to different data uh, workflows. And what are the co common customer references? Uh, these are also public references that are available. You can definitely read more about it on the AWS documentation. And uh, bringing the Gen AI perspective um, into uh, the data engineering workflow and common uh, use cases of Gen AI. And uh, I'm, I also have a demo uh, for a chatbot. And what are the common patterns of consuming different LLM models uh, as well? We're going to talk through them. All right. So uh, data adoption journey. I just gave a click. Uh, quick glimpse in, in my first slide when it when it says an organization data grows as as, as you progress. So as you if you are a startup with uh, with minimal uh, with minimal uh, connections or even captures and you have you tentatively uh, what what I have seen is uh, people generally start with the one or two data stores. It can be on prem or it can be on self managed infrastructure. Um, ad hoc queries that get fired away and you build reports and KPIs, which are minimal to meet the need. But as you grow and a uh, number of uh, interfaces that interact with this data increase, and so do the, uh, the personas, both internal and externals. It could be clients or it could be multi-tenant uh, SaaS organization as well. So at that point of time, you kind of start thinking about, hey, do you want to bring in an ETL or an ELT pipeline? Uh, what are the queues that I have to set up to ensure I don't run into memory issues uh, when there is a, a surge of data that, I, that I'm capturing through webhooks, et cetera? Or do I need a transaction log to keep an activity uh, a capture of what is happening across my different uh, EC2 instances or my storage layers or DB layers? And then uh, you also grow into the point where you want to bring in a data lake because you will have data coming in from multiple source systems and in different formats. Few might be in JSON, CSV, Avro, et cetera. You should have that capability of processing these data and also combine it with your existing data in, in the shortest for, uh, shortest cycles possible. And, and, and as you grow, um, uh, it can be, uh, again, uh, requirements like, uh, I want to understand ontologies of my uh, data. How, how are they associated? Do I need an MDM? I don't want every single person in my organization to update the schema. You want to uh, enforce uh, governance as well. Uh, as part of my previous organization um, uh, at HSBC, we uh, designed something called as uh, the uh, metadata management or the catalog for the entire organization. So because it, it went to, up to a scale where there were uh, thousands of applications and it was difficult to understand who is the rightful owner of a particular table or a database which is getting updated. So yeah, that's that's just to give you an idea of uh, scale and the challenges that come in. 
moving on here uh, i've kind of uh, this is a common architecture for a data processing we have seen data life cycle in previous slide but here i'm trying to talk you through what happens when uh, when a, a byte of data enters within the organization it starts with consuming from the producers and you have your ingestion pipelines built in it could be a cdc or it could be um, a pub sub model where uh, some where the source is publishing and this uh, target is actually consuming it in an uh, as in how the data arrives in in the order uh, uh, as per the timestamp processing again uh, it could be in various forms uh, hey do i want to do a schema validation uh, do i want to put the error records in certain dead letter queues so all that pro processing can be set up in the etl layer and 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 in certain cases it makes sense to go with elt as well so load everything you have the mechanism to query and then you transform as needed as well data storage now this can vary um, and with the big data ecosystem, uh, it, it has actually uh, evolved um, because uh, we, we want to separate both the compute and the storage. So kind of giving them a way to seamlessly grow because in certain cases, we do not need requirements to query uh, run, run complex queries or complex uh, Spark jobs on top of the data where you do not need additional processing units, yet my data bytes or the storage needs are increasing. So that's why we have compute, uh, we have now most of the storage or the uh, data warehouse uh, systems, which completely decouple both the storage and the compute. And ML modeling, now that's, that's another level. Once you have uh, set up your uh, efficient data engineering pipelines, you want to um, not creating multiple data copies, but you just want to uh, leverage the augmented ML capabilities of the service itself for common use cases. Uh, for most of the um, uh, use cases, actually yeah, going with forecasting, regression, classification, they, they actually uh, are, should be good enough. And unless you are AI centric and your model is uh, having certain key capabilities that you need to bring in from an AI perspective. Um, I, I think most of the cases I have seen uh, these uh, common NLP and de deep learning models uh, should be able to uh, improve your product. And then it comes to consumers. It can be your dashboards, uh, which can be both on the same cloud or uh, external third party tools as well. So this is at a high level uh, showing you the both engineering and the uh, consumption pipelines. Uh, sorry, any yeah. questions at this point? Sorry. Yeah, I think this is a great slide to take a short pause. Um, wanted to ask folks in the audience, since we all come from different kind of uh, scale, of, scale of the companies and different roles within that company. I heard that there are some folks who are doing DevOps, there are some folks who are doing uh, front end app development. Would love to hear some uh, folks uh, uh, from, 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 from some folks in terms of what problems you are currently facing uh, in your architecture when it comes to data engineering or data science or any ML application on top of it, uh, which you would like us to focus more on this session. I think Aniket, you also had a question. Um, yeah. So hi everyone. So I'm Aniket from EpiQ. So actually my current architecture is based on AWS itself, but uh, we wanted, uh, like in this session, I wanted to like ask, uh, first of all, I wanted to ask about this generative AI, if uh, it's possible, since uh, we have a uh, like a platform where we put all the data from various CRMs, like such as Salesforce, HubSpot and all, and we bring up insights at uh, one place for our clients and all, such as Gmail. So uh, now what I wish ki, if it's possible with AWS itself, ke, that uh, since the data is uh, present in AWS cloud itself, so if there's any modeling or uh, 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 deep learning methods here uh, provided itself from the AWS, which we can use and uh, use classifications and all, or like uh, we can identify any changes and all in the data, which we can like uh, use as a nudge for the clients and all. So if it's been pro provided by this generative AI and all, so wanted was, and uh, uh, when uh, from the storage point of view, uh, I'm using document DB, but uh, there's an update to you guys. Ki, uh, I'm just wanted to ask since Atlas DB is like, uh, uh, have seen ki it's more updated, 
but in document db there there are lots of features which are still pending suppose if you if you want to like uh, convert uh, an integer to string itself it's a small query to string uh, is a function but it's not usable in document db itself so i have like i have to like modify the queries uh, in a very like a long a long uh, uh, running queries i have to write for those single stuffs and all so there uh, that's one thing from the document db uh, thing and also the if i like uh, if i say ki doc, uh, the pricing and all if i say i'm not uh, talking about the pricing uh, in terms of that but uh, just wanted to like uh, ask from you guys ki uh, since i'm using document db and i have like uh, uh, removed the cluster from the singapore itself i was having at uh, two clusters so uh, initial was one uh, was on mumbai and the another was on singapore and i have closed the singapore also uh, cluster also but then also after 3 uh, to 4 days also i am seeing the billing coming from this uh, singapore region which i wanted to like uh, resolve uh, okay, why it's coming like why is it uh, why it's not updating like how frequently the cron jobs are running to update this billing process and all uh, this is why the the case is happening i wanted to like migrate from the document db to atlas uh, for this so but if it can be resolved from this itself then i will be relying on document db only and for this uh, mla i think uh, if you guys can help me like uh, okay, if uh, there's any way we can like build uh, ai models or something on top of your aws uh, using the data then it will be of great help will not be like having to go anywhere else so sure. um so aniket i think there are multiple questions so firstly um huh. if you are saying uh, you haven't mentioned about the type of data that is a format of data firstly if it is yeah. simple clustering use case you could mm. you run k means uh, or uh, uh, k means algorithm for clustering purpose and it doesn't mm. require generative ai for that um let's say you are using uh, redshift for uh, storing your data right now uh, for for the the crm data or okay. even if it's on s3 you can do mm. something called as using the sql query itself so sagemaker is our service where you have multiple uh, it's it's a, a multiple ml models catalog is available with the um, with the sample notebooks as well uh, and there you can deploy uh, one of these uh, k means more model choose how many number of uh, clustering uh, numbers or the num n value that you need and then once you deploy the endpoint you can reference that with a uh, redshift and with a simple sql query because most of the analysts usually are uh, comfortable with sql so that's the reason we have uh, embedded this functionality into the service where you should be able to uh, complete this clustering as well or you want to identify what's the churn associated with the uh, candidates as well uh, i think one of the questions is where you wanted to mm-hmm. do some nudge or send marketing uh, right. communications mm-hmm. you could do that as well uh, that's that's uh, through a prediction model identifying the patterns uh, based on yeah, dropouts this- and history so that can also be done um, even you can do that on quicksight as well it's our uh, visualization uh, service Uh, which which has uh, both the prediction and forecasting embeddings available so that's the two solutions on your document db part um, i think um, you can reach out to the support team uh, drop a note mm-hmm. or uh, actually i, I think best is yeah. uh, you know to connect to your account manager i think he can mm-hmm. answer all these questions shubham yes. can connect you to me and uh, i'll get the details from you and then loop in and yeah. that 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 would be a great help one more thing to ask uh, about this native ai only ki mm-hmm. uh, if i can state you with an example let's suppose my data is like uh, a ticketing data uh, from a support platform okay. so uh, so let's suppose i have i'm getting uh, uh, 100 tickets for a particular account so let's say tesla so i want like uh, i want to do th- i want the two uh, things from that data points such as the first one is the sentiment analysis which i am now doing with the help of chat gpt itself like uh, giving the uh, ticket uh, conversations to them and uh, getting it back from the chat gpt model so that that's the first requirement if it's possible with this uh, model if uh, it's present here in uh, any type the second one is th- uh, is to identify the change like suppose uh, uh, a ticket is having a stay priority key which is changing like a uh, ticket status is changing from uh, day to day on the basis so like uh, uh, i'm just giving the example for the ticket it uh, maybe it's the but this requirement will come for the opportunities and all 
So suppose any opportunities came and uh, they are marking it as like uh, it's closed one or something like uh, the revenue is uh, uh, increasing day by day or they are like monthly any time. So we want to like uh, see the changes and notify the user that uh, ki by identifying the pattern. See in the first month, yeah, I see that uh, the ARR has been changed. In the second month also, I have seen that the ARR has been changed. So I have to notify the client the, the ARR has been changed these two months. And also suppose if the third month the AR, uh, the ARR is not changed, the invitation value it's not changed, then also we'll have to notify that the ARR value is not changed. Maybe this can be the cause for uh, something which is uh, which should be taken into consideration. So yeah. this kind of pattern if uh, it's present. So Anikhil, I think, Anikhil, uh, yeah. yeah, go uh, ahead, Sujit, yeah, and okay. uh, maybe some of yeah. your some of your questions and others might also have questions around. Generally right. Specifically. Yeah, we'll. I I, I so, think uh, I'll be uh, able to cover them uh, in later slides, uh, or you might get them answered as well as yeah. I speak because a lot of that oh. is included. Okay. 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 Yeah, um, okay. So. Let me talk you through the different components of we just saw the processing of uh, the data and this is actually giving you an overlay of AWS services, which can help you build uh, these data pipelines and uh, you do you may not need all of these services actually. Uh, so it, it, it's that kind of a superset. Uh, so let's take, for example, you have your on-prem database. Uh, that's where you start with. And you're going to, uh, you want to bring that database to AWS uh, native services like Aurora. So you can do that with something called as a database migration service. It can do both heterogeneous and homogeneous transformation. Or if you have your uh, data that is crawling from social media platforms, you can use through webhooks. If you want, you can use uh, uh, Kinesis and Kafka uh, services to get that data into uh, for streaming analysis. And here, what you see at the bottom is the uh, speed or the real time. So uh, actually processing the data in a in, uh, live and real time manner, where you are actually seeing the event occur on the front end and that the same thing is being pushed into the uh, back end stores. And you're seeing a response coming on the right hand side as well, where you see those multiple devices attached. You can see a notification like an SMS sent out. So all that happens with the entire pipeline pipeline run in between a lambda function is triggering an ai service and a sentiment is generated and then it is pushed to uh, an a backend device which is again sending a notification to the user so that's an example i'm just picking it up from the recent discussion with uh, anikit that you have mentioned uh, similarly if you have uh, let's say a clickstream data that is coming in through uh, a customer user platform uh, multiple clicks on the platform, but you're not making an order. So you're spending a lot of time on certain web page, which gives us an opportunity to actually uh, make it more user friendly. So that kind of um, analysis can be done as well by capturing these set of events. And uh, again, this is a lot of data that keeps get, that you gather over a period of time and uh, a lot of it might become stale uh, uh, as time passes. So again, you need to move them into tiered storage. So a few of these storage tiers are also coming up with uh, with with a warm tier and a hot tier as well. Just don't just that you're efficiently storing your data as well and not mixing up with the archived or the historic data. And what you see at the top is uh, running your micro batches or batches uh, at certain times during the day. Uh, by storing them in S3. S3, as you know, is the uh, cheapest and the durable storage available uh, anywhere else and can bring in uh, data from in any format from uh, JPEG or uh, CSV, JSON, Avro, anything. Uh, put that in the format and you can use multiple services to translate that data, get the um, content of it and use it uh, in the serving or the reporting layer that you see here. Right, so this is like this is uh, helping you build uh, an entire pipeline, but again, very much uh, customized to your domain and your need. Having said that, uh, hope it has. Once we have uh, built the data engineering pipeline, the next we can take it forward to uh, bring in ML capabilities, both augmented and also if you want to bring in external LLM models as well. We'll see that in a bit. I have a few customer references here. So Samsung is uh, one such organization I mentioned about bringing uh, databases from uh, external sources. So they have migrated from Oracle to Amazon Aurora. Amazon Aurora is a managed service. It supports MySQL and PostgreSQL, the popular uh, uh, DB choices. And database migration service was actually used to complete this migration 
and with this they they were able to actually um, i think there was a scale that is given uh, 90% it, which has led to 90% of latency less than 60 milliseconds and which serves uh, even more faster with 40% operational costs um, a lot of it actually goes into the tco which is uh, the human effort that goes uh, that goes in building these pipelines in in the back end so that goes away when you're choosing a managed service and it gives you resiliency as well because amazon aurora is one service which creates six copies of your data internally so this this it's highly unlikely to lose your data um, and uh, you 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 could build in you could uh, spin up uh, read replicas as well to increase the read efficiency another example i have here is astrazeneca um, all of us know uh, so it requires uh, mul it performs multi genomics um, analysis before before uh, coming up with the clinical trials and um, associated uh, analysis so it it does uh, it is unifies 25 plus petabytes of multi omics data that's huge and it continuously keeps growing as as they expand to multiple regions so with with actually using uh, aws database service they were able to um, they're now prepared to scale up to 2 million whole genomics analysis by 2026 that's that's the scale at which they are able to grow and operate moving on to uh, the favorite topic um, and the topic of interest so generative ai on aws yes uh, i know there are multiple use cases uh, that generally people can come up with uh, so these can range um, across domains uh, from chatbots to um, personalization recommendation use case um, most of you i i know you uh, use amazon.com for uh, the retail platform uh, so where you select a particular product and you get a bunch of recommendations associated with the choice that you have made so that's that's all um, uh, the models machine learning models in the back end which are doing this personalization based on your previous chat previous history or or also based on uh, the similarity or doing the semantic search in the back end so and the other use cases which can drain, which can differ are code generation now um, something like a code whisperer uh, where you can actually just write a text a comment and then it translates to a syntax or a text which is actually cutting down your entire time uh, to build your uh, script and as well it can flag up uh, the security loopholes hey if if we are keeping a port open with one of the instructions that you have uh, given in the code so that gets flagged up as well so it's, this is actually reducing the overall uh, time that is taken by the developers and summarization um, i think in one of the cases you have mentioned you're using chat gpt where uh, you are giving actually a, a bunch of uh, stats and you're asking the model to do uh, the analysis and give a uh, give it set of understanding so it's like summarizing in a in a short form and giving me uh, top 5 things that uh, or actions that needs to be worked on uh, writing creative writing i know most of us uh, are using it for and uh, it's definitely finding place in designing modeling as well Process optimization, that's another interesting use case where uh, building your efficient CI CD pipelines as well and uh, DevOps automation cycling as well. Uh, that is where we are finding uh, generative AI uh, being used. Yeah, I think so just what? to add uh, one thing around chat GPT usage at work, obviously most of you would have heard a lot of larger companies clamping down on that because there's a data security issue uh, in using chat GPT. Of course, OpenAI has announced an enterprise plan which will come at a future point. But I think one of the things, Sarjana, maybe you can double click on as you enter this generative AI section is the security that is baked in by default where your data is already present and you can leverage these models to build your applications or use it for uh, any internal use case as well. Absolutely, Anurag, that's a great point. Um, yes, I have something on, on those lines as well. Um, just let's understand what's generative AI. How is it different from deep learning models? So we did have... A, neural networks deep learning models for the different use cases now what has what's special about generative ai now these are models which have been trained on billions of parameters and a lots of uh, web crawl data so there is something called as as a web uh, lifetime on which the data has been extracted and it's used for training the models and they, that becomes uh, so that becomes your base model on which you you can ask uh, literally anything uh, irrespective of uh, I, I give it a report, I give it an invoice and ask it, hey, tell me what's the total summary looking like. So it doesn't need uh, to be uh, trained um, 
uh, to a particular use case. So it works in a generic manner. So that's where um, that's where uh, generative AI find its, finds its place into every uh, domain. And it requires minimal fine tuning, uh, unlike the previous uh, neural network called deep learning models. And that's where you, you can bring in your existing historic data and just do uh, minimal uh, cycles of epochs uh, for with your uh, data fine tuning as well. Now the point, what has changed uh, in 2022 is scale. So you see these models actually started with um, the number of parameters you, uh, has uh, continuously kept growing. And we now have like Switzy and the latest Llama 2, uh, it's I think 70 billion is, is, the, is the one that was uh, recently released as well. So I think this keeps growing as the number of parameters and training increases. So this came, uh, the trend started with uh, something called as the transformer architecture. You, this is one sentence that you see on the screen. Now, um, we spoke about uh, sentiment. Uh, what would you associate uh, as a sentiment for this statement? The food was great, but the service was terrible, right? It, 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 is, it is slightly confusing. And if I have to actually highlight and do some association with a particular word, food, so what is what does each mean word relate to when it comes to food? So that's what has changed with the transformer uh, architecture that is uh, with the pa with the paper that you see on my screen. It's called attention is all you need. It's it's a it's actually telling you about translating each sentence and giving you relations and tra converting it into a form where you're actually giving a weightage to each of these words and can encoding it into a format where it can be stored in a vectorized format and do recommendations or search on top of it. It's, it's actually a very highly recommended paper. Right, so it's it's these are the keywords that that uh, the model is going to look at when it does uh, the encoding part. Okay, so this uh, slide is actually talking about uh, AI ML stack. Now, in so in although we know uh, JAI is the latest trend, uh, people want to catch up. But uh, the question is, do you really need it for your use case, uh, or do you really want to spend? Uh, X amount of dollar additional for the same set of use case. Sentiment analysis is a is one such example. You could achieve that with a uh, published ML model endpoint, which is through Amazon Comprehend. You don't need any ML expertise. You don't need to write a piece of code as well. Um, so that that comes in with a score associated with a part when when you pass in a text. With that score, you can write a, a pipeline giving hey if it's beyond 50%, then send this notification. If it's less than that, uh, repeat the process or something like that. And uh, the SageMaker, Amazon SageMaker, so now this is the service where uh, you have uh, pre-published uh, notebooks available for multiple models, and also the generative AI models, the popular models, Falcon, Llama, uh, all those models are available on the SageMaker Studio. And it, it's an IDE with the uh, pre-built notebooks, sample notebooks as well. Um, with few clicks, you should be able to deploy these models on the GPU instances, um, and you should be able to run your inferences, right? So that's uh, one way of consuming LLM uh, models. Another one is Amazon Bedrock. Now, what we have seen is, um, the people started using multiple open source models and they've run into very quickly run into challenges like latency, cost and security. Uh, these are very common concerns uh, we've been hearing. Security because uh, you see most of these AWS services, you can deploy them within your VPC perimeter, which remains uh, private. So you could do that with uh, the LLM models deployed on Amazon SageMaker or with Bedrock. So you are uh, so your model is secure and the fine-tuned endpoint as well will be secure. The data used uh, for inferencing will also be secure. Um, it, and when it comes to cost, so there are two different ways. So uh, Amazon SageMaker, you're using the instance and in Bedrock, actually, these are the uh, models can be consumed in an API format. So you're not keeping your uh, model, uh, the instance that is hosting your model live all throughout the day. Rather, only when you need to do that inferencing, you're calling the model endpoint and running the uh, running the inferencing. And then you get charged only for that duration. 
uh, plus the number of tokens that you give as input and the output that you get. So all this pricing is also published on both the uh, Amazon Bedrock page and also the third party uh, models that are uh, that are available through Bedrock. So I hope this answers uh, the point which Anurag uh, raised some time back. So these are the uh, different models that are right now available through Bedrock, uh, AI21, Jurassic model, uh, Anthropic Cloud, uh, Stability AI, and the Amazon's own Titan models. Stable Diffusion, I hope many of you are familiar. So the DG avatars that are that are being created, that's coming from the stable, stable, stable sorry, Stability AI, AI models. And uh, Anthropic Cloud, uh, it gives you mostly for the summarizations, chat interfaces, uh, cloud uh, models are working perfectly fine. And if you want to uh, choose which model for which use case, actually you should look up for the, uh, the Stanford page where uh, it gives you a comparison between uh, different models that you can pick up for different use cases or the Hugging Face uh, own uh, page as well where some ranking has been provided. Now, these are all um, very uh, self-driven rankings. Uh, nothing is uh, reliable uh, i would actually suggest you pick one or two models which are actually doing really well and then you can you can choose the model based on uh, the uh, efficiency and the output that you're uh, that you want to receive for anthropic cloud is uh, is one thing that i would definitely suggest if you want to go with the uh, summarization models etc or uh, embeddings, you can choose both uh, Amazon's own Titan and Cohere embed models. Private customize uh, your models as well. So you should be able to fine tune your model. Uh, right now it's available for Titan, but for the 3P models, it, the third party models, uh, we, we are going to eventually add because the, uh, the service went uh, GA very recently. Got it. So Jadir, one question. I know you mentioned that uh, fine tuning is currently possible on Titan uh, and then you come to other uh, foundation models as well. But uh, we are seeing new use cases merge where uh, the smaller models, for example, the Mistral 7 billion, which is not that heavy, a lot of app, uh, people want to build applications by bringing that into their own VPC. So the question is for that kind of scenario where someone wants to leverage a newer foundational model which is not part of the offering for better today, should they be choosing SageMaker and running the whole MLOps process there? Uh, how, how would you recommend they go about it? Good question. So uh, yes, for those models which are not available on um, Bedrock, by the way, Lamaya 2 is also in the pipeline uh, for Bedrock. Uh, SageMaker Jumpstart, yes, that's the place you can choose the published uh, LLM models, or you can also bring in uh, deep learning containers. So there, uh, you will get the uh, the Python um, the Python framework, and you will get the data science uh, uh, data science train instances or the AMI custom AMIs on which you can launch these models. So that's another mechanism in case you do not find the model available on Jumpstart as well to bring your custom models. But uh, most of the common uh, models releasing in the market, you're seeing them, uh, I mean, we're seeing them uh, on Jumpstart in about uh, two weeks time frame. So that should definitely in the pipeline. Understood, thank you. Okay, uh, I think the previous slide was actually talking about the different foundation models available right now on Bedrock, which we have covered uh, previously. So um, yeah, this slide is telling you about the fine tuning that can be done, uh, as I've mentioned. So uh, as one of the customers actually have done forked a uh, Llama 2 model and uh, customized it for their domain. Now, this is tricky. I want you to understand um, as frequently as your data keeps changing, it doesn't make sense to fine tune the model. Rather, you should uh, use it as a prompt, pass it to the model and get the output. Uh, but if your data remains consistent um, for a longer period of time, then you should go with a fine tuning. Or you could do a mix of both, uh, depending on the uh, depending on the the segregation that you have done on on the uh, data freshness as well. So that's on the fine tuning, and these these are the options available for deploying your AI models um, on AWS. So here, as you see. In between, this is the jumpstart screen, which is showing you different models. So you can launch the SageMaker Studio, and uh, you go to the uh, jumpstart. You, you can search for the lookup for the model and click on it and just deploy. So that's that's like few clicks deployment of your uh, LLM models. 
Uh, publicly available models can be um, modified as well, but uh, the um, the proprietary models, you will only have to use them for inferencing. These are the different models. Uh, the left side ones, um, uh, Falcon, uh, Flantify, uh, and uh, Llama models are available right now for um, where you can fork them, you can modify them as well, and create your own custom LLM. And the proprietary ones can be used um, for inferencing purpose. So why AWS for Generative AI? So it's the flexibility because you get a choice of different models available. It's secure. Uh, you're going to deploy it within the VPC perimeter itself. And it's cost effective. Uh, as I've mentioned, um, you get a choice of different GPU instances on which you can deploy. Um, there's something called as uh, AWS uh, Inferentia and Trainium. It's our own um, accelerated computing instances that we provide, um, at, which give you a GPU equivalent uh, capacity, but at a much uh, uh, cost-effective price as well. So you can deploy a SageMaker model on um, Inferentia and Trainium as well. Easy to build uh, with easy to build with foundation models. Um, with with the length and breadth of AWS capabilities. So we just spoke uh, where in case you have your existing historic data sitting in one of the data stores, it is easy to combine and uh, train your models or use it for inferencing. And uh, also use uh, Genetive AI powered solutions like um, Code Whisperer is a great example where it's a coding companion uh, to write uh, a piece of code that you can push that same piece of code to GitHub and uh, build your entire code pipeline. Having discussed that, uh, how what are the different patterns of consuming an LLM. So this is important to understand. Um, now, in certain cases, as I've mentioned, you definitely don't need fine tuning. Everybody doesn't need fine tuning. So all you need to do is do prompt engineering. So you can do uh, zero shot training, few shot training. Uh, what, what, what does that mean? So zero shot is nothing but you're just firing a question and uh, the model is giving you an answer. So that's that's zero shot and few shots is you give me A leads to B, B leads to C. So tell me what C leads to. So you're giving a cyclic question to the model and you're expecting a response. So that's that's a uh, no, few shot training. And and actually, uh, I can show you one of them, uh, which I've built in the demo as well for few shot training. RAG is an interesting concept where uh, we don't want hallucination uh, in, in the response as well. So you're just passing the context, enough context to the model so that it makes the uh, related decision based on the past context. Uh, so this is very uh, um, appropriate in, in, in terms of a chat use case where uh, somebody has um, spoken to a chatbot or, call, or had a conversation with a call center and there is some information that has been provided already. You don't want to repetitively ask the same set of questions. So you're giving context to the model and they can accordingly give you a response. So that's a RAG model. Uh, we'll look into it a bit. Um, and model from scratch, that's definitely the most expensive one, um, which uh, could take a lot of time and also you need skill. And um, accordingly, if I have to match that with the cost metrics, okay. Model building model from scratch uh, will definitely, it, it's like, um, uh, as you go down the table, uh, the, price, uh, the cost increases for managing your LLM model. Okay, I'm actually rushing through a little bit here. Um, key issues, yes. Uh, hallucination, as I've mentioned, because uh, model can continue to give uh, answer, which is even uh, not relevant, um, The mo even after the point uh, where it has given the adequate information. Lack of access to current information on proprietary information sources or reasoning. Um, so these are a few current challenges which have already been highlighted by most of the customers uh, using the open source models. So Jenny, one question which uh, others in the audience might also have and would love to hear if um, mm -hmm. any other takes, but uh, wanted to understand uh, the advantage that a team might have being on Bedrock when it comes to building an LLM map with RAG. Right, so let's take a situation where I have both unstructured and stru structured data and different data sources. I, I want to leverage uh, RAG over my Redshift uh, with as minimal steps as possible while I'm trying out my app. So what capabilities do Bedrock have to sort of simplify this process of uh, tinkering while you're still building the app uh, on the platform? That's 
right okay sure so ra yes give me one give me 30 seconds i just want to walk through the rag and then i'll answer your question so rag uh, for those of you who do not know is a retrieval augmented and generation uh, pattern what this means is you're sending your existing uh, customer data or existing data corpus as we normally refer to that's being passed to an llm model to generate embeddings uh, or the vectors these vectors are stored in a vector database and whenever a user fires a query only the relevant set of uh, information is passed to the text generation model which takes in that input and generates the necessary response to the user rather than actually uh, blowing up uh, the uh, or searching the entire set of embeddings so this is like context based response now your to your question uh, what a uh, bedrock uh, let's say i have some data that's sitting in my sit, sitting in redshift and there is some unstructured data which is also in s3 or some videos uh, uh, for, i'm trying to do some uh, call user analytics what you can do with bedrock is you can tra translate using amazon titan embeddings model you can convert them into vectors and there are uh, vector uh, databases uh, capabilities available with aws services like open search and pg vector Uh, which is the uh, postgres sql uh, extension plugin which is a, which can store these vector databases now the benefit that you get uh, while sto while storing these vectors in these existing per persistent data stores is you can combine it with your historic data so the moment you are uh, running a query uh, getting the semantic results or uh, let's say a recommendation is coming out you can match it up with the other relevant metadata or the previous history associated with that particular customer interaction as well and pull that data as part of your summary uh, rather than going to multiple data sources as well uh, this can be achieved with with simple uh, uh, join query as well so that's the benefit that you get when you are uh, using bedrock and another benefit is i as i have mentioned it's uh, you're going to execute an api based call to your llm model so you only spend for the time you are using the model plus only the the number of tokens that you're going to pass as input uh, to the model that effectively reduces the cost and you don't have to worry about hey am i am i having enough uh, gpu capacity available for uh, hosting my model and uh, running my embeddings etc so the, all that uh, pain is taken away with the uh, amazon bedrock got it awesome okay so this is actually a high level architecture uh, for multiple different use cases uh, where we are creating embeddings and storing them uh, in in the db it it can start with um, a user interaction which is stored in uh, memory cache and we have uh, the vector embedding stored in our different databases as i've mentioned open search and pg vector kendra is another service uh, for users who do not want to worry about uh, generating vectors who just want to keep indexing my documents hey and yet have an interface built a chat interface built on top of it uh, to get the responses uh, or find the results from that documents and uh, to generate embedding itself there are two options you can use uh, sagemaker and bedrock and here uh, in in the right hand side you see uh, the first part of the section we discussed uh, building your uh, etl pipelines and generating your data processing so that you can do it in both a uh, serverless manner with uh, aws glue you can write your code with in pyspark framework and emr actually gives you um, it's it's a playground where you can bring in your uh, apache frameworks like hbase hive uh, spark um, and and uh, and run your code in a distributed format so that's that's a high level architecture of uh, a rag based uh, giving you context based responses how are we doing with time anurag i think can i we... go to the Yeah, we might have a couple of minutes to wrap up. Uh, but folks, if you have any questions that you would like us to cover, please put them in the chat. I think we'll have time for uh, taking up two, three of them. So feel free to do that at this point. But so, Jenny, I think we can cover two, three more minutes. Sure, I'll quickly brush through. Um, so from the similar rag architecture, uh, what you see on my screen is a notebook, which is using. open search as a vector database and here i've used two different llm models one is the hugging face bert model to generate the embeddings and for that i am actually using a g5 instance uh, which is a gpu instance to generate these embeddings and store these on vector uh, database open search and then i'm using so this is the my test dataset uh, it's actually 
multiple wines and what are the different title, description, taster name, variety, etc. It's it's a very much structured data, and and with few fields which has a lot of description, so they they're wider. Um, so this is in a JSON format, and that's the input that I'm taking. Okay, and once I have generated these embeddings and loaded them to my open search index, what I'm doing next is I'm passing something called, uh, I'm creating a template of response. Now, whenever my, a, a user is on the interface, I don't want um, uh, random responses for, uh, for coming out of the model. Rather, what I've done is something called as templatizing, or doing a zero shot training to the model. Uh, and for the text summarization itself, we are using Falcon 7B. Let me show you. So here, what I'm doing is, um, yeah. So here you see, I'm doing semantic search on, on a particular query. Uh, so here I'm firing one query, a wine that pairs well with meat. Can you give me the response? What is this? What is, what is that? So here it is telling me some X wine. It actually goes and some more additional information based on the corpus data that it has gathered. So here, uh, uh, we are deploying a Falcon 7B model because I want my summary, my response to be in a particular template format. And I'm doing uh, a templatization here. So I'm rendering a prompt. Here I'm doing a zero shot training actually um, by passing a single response. And this is how my uh, response should look like. So now it has modified uh, the response in, in this particular prompt format, right? Yep, so that's uh, so now I have the model deployed. I have both the LLMs uh, deployed on the instance and I can start inferencing, which is start asking questions. So here I have uh, a, a question which is saying, hey, instead of meat, I just asked, I changed it to olives and I'm asking, okay, uh, now this is the response the model is giving me. Yep, this is a very quick demo. Uh, but uh, happy for you to uh, reach out. And if you want to look into the uh, deployment, uh, I can walk you through later as well. Any questions that you have for me at this point? Let me look at the chat. Folks, we'll, uh, we'll have time for maybe covering one or two questions. So if you have any, yeah. feel free to ask right now. Otherwise, probably wrap up. Yeah, because we have a hard stop at Five, so we have two more minutes. So any, uh, I think we can pick a question or two, if at all, from the group. Okay, cool. I think uh, Sajana to wrap up, maybe you can uh, talk a little bit about where folks can go to get these resources. For example, the Jupyter that you showed, I guess they're available on the SageMaker platform, but any follow-ups to the session which you would like to recommend, maybe you can wrap up with us. Yeah, uh, so I'm actually on this. So let me, yeah. So this is a, a notebook uh, where, okay, so I was actually working with the rag but uh, there are a few more deployments uh, on this page. It's on AWS samples. Um, not just this one, you can actually look up for uh, open search or PG vector, uh, generative AI use cases. You will find a bunch of them, uh, both on blogs and AWS samples as well. Great. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, thank you, Sarjanya, for the session. I know we probably didn't get to cover everything that you had in mind, but I think a great uh, introduction about Bedrock and for folks who are building Jenny applications. Uh, please, uh, we'll be sharing the recording at a later point, but feel free to reach out to Shubham, Sarjanya, current directly if you have any questions regarding your AWS account, or feel free to reach out to us at Elevation Capital if you are building in the space and you would uh, want to discuss uh, your idea at this point. Uh, thank you so much for joining in. Um, uh, look forward to hosting all of you in the next uh, tech session.